good afternoon. Hi, welcome to Hawaii, the state of clean energy. I'm Ray Starling, your host, and uh, Jay couldn't be with us today because of conflict, but he will be with us in spirit. Uh, we do have a very interesting show, and not just because Jay's not here, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> it's all about security. We miss you, Jay. <laughs> it's all about security with a focus on cybersecurity and some of the vulnerabilities that can happen to our clean energy grid as it grows and expands in the digital age. My guest today is an expert, Andrew Lanning. Uh, he's Vice President at Integrated Securities Technologies, uh, a Hawaii-based business that Andrew co-founded back in 1998 uh, with his wife, who he- The real he's boss. associated the with. The real boss, oh yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Andrew, uh, you've got quite a resume. I'm just going to read just a few nice things uh, uh, about you so people kind of get an idea. Sure, but thank you. uh, you're all about security and cybersecurity. And um, you started back in 1982. You know COBOL and Fortran. Some guys have remember to be as old days? as me before <laughs> they re uh, remember that. Uh, but you also served in. Uh, in uh, the Navy mm -hmm. uh, back during the Persian Gulf War. Yeah, that's how I uh, got to Hawaii. Yeah, and uh, you, you were a miss missile technician, and that's kind of where you got your start. Uh, you, I, I'm not going to go through all of this, but basically you're on multiple committees and uh, uh, networks that, uh, that where you participate in moving information back and forth about cybersecurity. Yeah. Um, and you've got a degree, started out in psychology uh, at uh, UH, and you've got a master's in uh, communications uh, from uh, Hawaii Pacific University. Mm -hmm. And, uh, well, welcome to the thanks, show. Thanks We're for very happy to, good to, be here. to have uh -huh. you here today. So, uh, before we get into the uh, topic of um, technology uh, related to cyber and uh, things that can uh, that can go bang in the night. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your com company? What what does it do? So we're uh, in Hawaii. You're to do electronic security systems. You're a contractor. So we're a contracting firm. Um, you can think of us as an electrical contractor, but we specialize in low voltage systems. So you know we're pulling, uh, we're installing pipe and cabling and getting all the infrastructure put in, and then we're installing all that equipment on the walls. Uh, be it cameras or, or access control card readers, intercoms, uh, intrusion detection systems. Um, then, you know, all that stuff today has a server and software and client-side applications that have to be configured. And then you do the training for the end user and teach them how to, how to manage it and get the reports out of it and, and deal with the system. So, you know, we're kind of a, a nuts and bolts, you know, to say we're electrical contractors only leaves it a little thin because we got, you know, a lot of IT types and, and database types and, mm -hmm. you know, application guys in our company as well. So, you know, we're a... Uh, we're a pretty IT savvy little group. Electronic security has become that 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 piece of the industry today. Well, we thought this uh, this would be a good combination with uh, you and me. You know a lot about cybersecurity, and I know just enough about the energy world to know that things are going nuts in the energy sure. world now, and cybersecurity is becoming much more important than it ever has before to the grid that we're all connected to. Uh, so, um, you know, before we get into those kinds of questions, though, uh, can you give us some general ideas about the just uh, regular Joes out there that have connections to the grid or to the Internet, rather, that uh, they might keep in mind, whether it's a business or an individual, mm. uh, to try to uh, minimize the vulnerabilities that are inherent in just connecting mm. to a bunch of other people out there? Yeah, so we talk about the that uh, threat surface, you know, that vulnerability surface, right? And all the devices that you have that connect to the internet are are talking to something. They all have a, a MAC address. They all have an IP address. They all have a a, a um, suite of protocols that they talk with, right? So all these devices, when you connect it, there's actually sixty five thousand plus ports on that IP address. Right, and so you might use one of them, port 25, for SMTP, simple mail transfer protocol, to do email with, for example. You might be doing a file transfer over FTP, which is another port, um, or Telnet. So, uh, when you connect with a browser to to a device to maybe view its configuration settings, everyone's probably set up a router at home or or, or installed some sort of a device where they had to first, you know, bring it online, and they use a browser on port 80. 
and it, that browser is an HTTP port connection, right? So that's connected to port 80. Um, so there's, there's a lot of these uh, system ports. The first 1,056 of them, I think, are system ports, and there's user ports and ports for many, many things. So, you know, people I don't think are aware that there's so much open, open ports available for uh, vulnerabilities to be present on. So that's a port in your computer or your server? It's a port on the actual IP address itself. So okay. every, every IP address, just, you know, when you have a device that acquires an IP address, it's, this is the uh, protocols that these things talk with. Protocols right. run right. over those ports. Okay. Yeah. All right. So uh, what should an individual do to try to protect himself? What's the simplest way you can try to prevent something bad from happening to your own system within your uh, your residence let's say yeah so the the residential the consumer you know the average consumer i think is 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 hamstrung with understanding a lot of this technology so you know if you if you really don't know what you're doing at all you you need some get some help first of all but if you if you've got a little bit of savvy and you want to understand you can get tools that are free like zenmap for example um, you can run zenmap from behind your firewall and that'll scan your network for you and give you a, a report of all the devices that are attached. You may not even know that your light bulbs are talking to your internet or whatever it may be if, you, if you're not aware of all the stuff that's been installed. You know, if you have uh, maybe wireless thermostats and mm -hmm. your HVAC guy installed them and you don't really know that they're there. Um, typically, uh, these devices, these, um, some of these tools will also report the ver firmware version so you can go out and check that manufacturer's website to make sure you have the latest firmware version. Maybe you need to up, upgrade that firmware. And please, you know, a lot of consumers don't even get a router, right? And they think that the, like their Time Warner cable modem is a router protecting them. And oftentimes none of that stuff's enabled or it's all just defaulted. So mm -hmm. you really need to get your own firewall put in and understand, you know, how to manage that firewall so that everything's closed except the things that you want to be working. Now, is that something that most people would likely be able to do or not be able to I do? I think if you, yeah, if you, if you follow the manual, the trick is to not accept that, you know, make sure you, you follow the guide. Don't just get it working and stop. Make sure everything that you don't need working is turned off. Uh, and that's a, a critical step that a lot of the consumer grade equipment just doesn't run you through. It's designed more for easy plug and play. You've, right. heard, you've heard of a, of a tool called universal plug and play a lot of these devices have. Well, just because you got it working doesn't mean it's secure. It may have be open. Like I said, maybe by default FTP is open. A lot of, a lot of manufacturers have ports open that are like for, so that they could remotely service a device without having to come to your location to do that. And so by default, there, there may be a hardwired default password on that port that they can access, and that may be able to be known by simply, you know, searching on the internet for, you know, default password for a Linksys router, or for example. So um, that kind of stuff has to definitely be locked down, you know, for sure at the consumer and the small business and the business, medium-sized business. You know, we see this across the spectrum, all the way up to the enterprise guys who have an IT department. They're right. working on it as best they can, as much resources as they've been given. But right below the enterprise. Um, the problems are rampant, the vulnerabilities are out there. So if you did have a small business and you wanted to protect yourself and you didn't feel like you knew enough about all of the things we've talked about thus far, sure. uh, would, you, would you likely just hire a firm like yours or somebody out there to come in and sort of check it out and fix whatever is... Uh, Risky. Yeah, so we're we're an electronic security firm, so we're not. I really try not to. I really try to steer clear of the IT, which is all the workstations and servers and switches and routers. Um, we know about that, but I definitely could give people references. There are a ton of great small businesses in Hawaii that sort of specialize in that area, and they can okay. get you some help. That's good. And um, uh, business owners for sure should be doing these types of assessments. You know, if you're businesses, the, the, the sort of trend in businesses today is that the regulated industries, that being critical infrastructure, which I know we're going to talk about, um, healthcare, uh, fi the financial sector, all of these guys, and now their supply chains that are bringing stuff to them. Maybe you're just their, their HVAC guy, or maybe you're their POS vendor. That's your point of sale systems. Uh, or maybe you're an electronic security vendor like I am. Um, we're starting to get um, the same sort of regulations that they're held to pushed down on us by them, you know, in their contracting verbiage. So it isn't regulatory. It's just that they want their supply chain to be mm -hmm. as secure as they are. And that's a fair thing. So if, you know, if you're in business, probably you're going to see some of that coming at you if you service uh, any, of the any of the regulated industries for sure. 
Okay, let's, um, let's go from regular business and residential uh, situations to uh, the grid. Sure. And, and uh, from my perspective, the grid is uh, growing. It uh, used to be just the utility. Mm -hmm. It owned the grid. It did everything on the grid. It was the one that, that made the electricity, sent it to the customers. Okay. And uh, they've started uh, allowing independent generators to come on. And uh, those were usually, in the early days, were big uh, systems that were contracted to sell their power to the grid, but the utility still had full control of it. I see. Now we're getting into a situation where uh, a lot of people have PV on their roofs, mm -hmm. and a lot of people are actually generating power uh, at some times. They push it out onto the grid, and sometimes they, uh, they, there's no, when the sun's not shining, they, they take it from the grid. And that begins to uh, make a lot more complexity to the grid. It was already pretty complex, but now you've got multiple parties on the grid that are uh, needing to uh, talk to one another in some form or fashion mm -hmm. or get signals or this, this, may not, this may not be what's happening right this moment, but it will be happening mm -hmm. as people give sometimes and take other times uh, that's going to be uh, part of the grid that has to be secured, cybersecurity. Mm, okay. Because Is it like for load balancing? Yes, okay. load balancing. Sure. And some of it's going to be automated, some of it's going to be worked by a third party, but there will hmm. be many more entities plugged in and pushing stuff onto the system or taking it off at will, okay. and that becomes uh, a big problem because, uh, and I don't even know how big the problem is, I'm asking you to sort of uh, give us your idea about what needs to be done uh, on the grid scale to help protect the grid from uh, nefarious people hmm. doing things on the grid that they shouldn't be. Well, I mean, we saw the attack out west, right? There was a physical attack, obviously, right? Guys tried to, to take down the substation right. um, by That's firing at it, right? So there's the, if we remove, if we say, okay, we're, we know it's, you know, we can't move, we can't move it. It's not mobile. So, you know, it it's, can come under physical attack and we'll just leave that as is. So, um, Outside of physically attacking uh, those those facilities, right? Because I'm, I'm, I'm just guessing if we're going to take down the grid, we're talking about sort of like destabilizing it by taking a substation offline, um, you know, in, in a big way. Right. But the 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 smaller guys, for example, if I've got a, a device, a load a load management device that's talking ostensibly to another load management device across the island, it must it's either using internet or some kind of wireless protocol, right? right? So. Those types of devices are the same, are similar to the devices that we have in, in the electronic security system industry where they all have a that web interface I was talking mm -hmm. about, that HTTP port or that HTTPS port. And I do um, sit on Underwriter Labs uh, is currently working on a new specification for the industrial control systems as well. They're, they're embedded you know, little Linux web engine has the same problems as many of the other ones do, especially some of the older ones. So they don't even run uh, encryption on that connection. So it's very easy to brute force attack it and sort of take it over. Um, in the future, I think we'll, we'll see those devices. Currently, I think most of the utilities are, are working to sort of firewall that stuff and they need to know about it, right? They've got inventories right. of it, but right. you know, I don't think we can just let it open up and talk, right? Because it's got to be uh, monitored today. Now, the newer ones where we can get some encryption will probably be a little better. Let's, let's hold that thought for right now. We've okay. got to take a break and oh, we'll pay come some back bills. And, yes, and move along. All right. Thank you. Aloha, Howard Wig. I am the proud host of Code Green, Think Tech Hawaii. I appear every other Monday at 3 in the afternoon. Do not tune in in the morning. My topic is energy efficiency. It sounds dry as heck, but it's not. We're paying $5 billion a year for imported oil. My job is to shave that, shave that, shave that down in homes and buildings 
while delivering better comfort, better light, better air conditioning, better everything. So if you're interested in your future, you'd better tune in to me. Three o'clock every other Monday, code green, aloha, and thank you very much. Okay, we're back and uh, we've got a great show for you today with Andrew Lanning, who's with Integrated Security Technologies. And he's, uh, we've been talking about, uh, we've sort of been moving up the scale from individual users of the internet and the cybersecurity that's uh, necessary there. But we've gotten, gone to the, the big grid that the power system uses to move power around. And uh, it's getting bigger and it's getting a lot more players involved. And we were starting to talk about sort of how do we think through uh, trying to protect that grid against cyber attacks mm -hmm. because uh, that those can take down the entire grid and uh, that uh, that's certainly a, a possibility anytime but as we grow and more people are are connecting to the grid and pushing power to the grid or taking it back uh, depending on whether the sun's shining their PV is working that is going to be the big uh, problem for us going forward, a problem for the utility and ultimately a problem for all the customers. Uh, so we were talking about sort of how we go about that or how you would expect the, uh, the utility systems to, um, uh, to plan for that and, and help to, uh, to uh, defend against it. Uh, so it, we, we've got, what we've got is uh, people who are uh, new to this whole thing, uh, they're becoming engaged and uh, they're connecting and what vulnerabilities could they bring onto the system uh, because they're having to talk and, and through their smart meters talk to the utility and or talk to somebody to let, uh, let the grid know what's happening at their individual station where they're taking power or giving power. Mm. So. Uh, do you have any thoughts about that? I know that's not, it, it, nobody knows very much about it now. I mm. mean, it's a growing industry. But uh, do you have any thoughts about sort of how, where you would start if you were trying to fix the, but the potential problem? Sure. So the, what, I, what, I, what I saw with um, um, Underwriter Labs has taken this on as well. Uh, underwriter laboratories you know they they have a stamp for like your fire systems and things so they've definitely taken an interest in this and the the industrial control systems is a is a special subsection of the series 2900 that they're working on so um, you know the the idea that the firmware in those devices isn't been well tested and could be thwarted right with them um, you've probably heard of certain thing buffer overflows and, and different types of attacks that can be run just against the firmware so the first thing was to get those manufacturers to start running their firmware through the same type of processes that guys like Cisco and Microsoft and the rest of the IT world have done for for a long long time so that that um, standard is being written um, I'd say it's a few years from being published and then probably we're another year or two beyond that before we get equipment that's been put through that process and can be um, have a, have a layer of cyber assurance that you know when the when the installer gets it or when the company gets it they can know that it's got all these assurances that, and tests that have been run against it right so we're lacking that today probably in the stuff that's out there and so the the level of vulnerabilities is probably as open to the you know to just the uh, whim of an attacker, you know, his, his desire to want to thwart something. You know, if you can find out what type of a piece of equipment was used, and, you know, unfortunately, there's a habit of um, con contractors, architects, all this, these design specs all just float around for mm -hmm. bidding purposes, mm -hmm. right? So it really wouldn't be hard to find out what type of a piece of equipment down to this specific part number is installed here for perhaps monitoring an endpoint or a load bouncing type piece of gear. So then you just can go procure one and then figure out how to attack it, right? And so, mm -hmm. you know, just at home before you, you know, ever go, ever go to actually run a real attack against yeah. it. So there's, there's that kind of stuff. And there, there's, there are guys, you know, that are em employed by utilities and 
uh, th some of those manufacturers, many cases that are working on this stuff too. So they get paid, uh, white hat hackers get paid to find those vulnerabilities as well. Okay. And they get paid by the manufacturer to find them before the bad guys okay. do. The white hats are the, the ones, the, the good The white guys. hats are the good guys, sure. <laughs> Used to be the bad guys, yeah. maybe. <laughs> the, the, <laughs> the, the bigger concern that we have with, with utilities and um, it's so if, if I find something, the last thing I'm going to really do is just go break a utility. Why would I do that? What I'm going to do is try to get my malware spread out into as many utilities as I can. Now I've got a valuable tool. If I could take down the East Coast, the West Coast, or Hawaii, or whatever it may be, mm -hmm. from in a hacker speak, now I've got something I can sell. It doesn't do me any good to take down my power, but what's the point of that? But you someone, want money for but it. someone yeah. may want that yeah. capability. So that's what I'm going to do is sell that capability to right. them. And you know you can just auction it off. You know, you typically need to do a little proof of concept for them, but um, that's yeah. all. The the buying and selling of this capability is sort of what what we what we have today, and in, in the on the black market. On you know, black, where where would I mean, not that I would ever go there, but where would you go? What what's like dark of, leaks or there's there's a ton dark, of sites. Yeah. Sure, I can. Okay. Yeah, you can buy tons of of attacks, tons of attack tools. You can buy f whole kits. Um, that, that have all the known attacks against anything you want. Um, you can get Kali Linux for free. A lot of this stuff you can have for free. A lot of it you can lease. There's like leasing models for, for a DDoS attack, for example. And do you want to do it for 30 seconds or do you want to do it by, a by, D, by a the DDoS? size? A, a, D, a denial of service attack. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, so like if I um, say I just wanted to make sure you couldn't get any energy in your neighborhood maybe. You know, I could maybe take that stuff, take an area down for a while. Mm -hmm. Right, just just as an example, it's more done against like websites and web services and things like that, where they they slam it with so much data that no one else can get to it. So it's a denial of the service. Mm -hmm. So imagine if I take your bank, you know, your banking service offline or something like that. But you know, all of these things are are um, available to people that are just willing to work on it to make money. There's a ton of money in this type of crime, and that you know that's a problem. Now, let's say you're a business owner or you know a CEO somewhere uh, that wanted to just keep up kind of with what's going on. Just kind of, not, they don't want to dig into it deeply, but mm. they'd like to kind of watch what's going on. Is there a website or is there a government agency or, or perhaps a, a magazine that's that's pretty good about those kinds of things? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I would. I would tell anybody definitely to follow a guy like Brian Krebs who, who blogs. He was a journalist that um, uh, got hacked and he, he got, he's gotten very deeply into the world of hacking. And so yeah. he, he takes really um, some, some sinister things and, and really explains it in layman terms. Um, CEOs, I think, have more concerns than, than that, though. They've mm -hmm. got to be concerned about their own enterprise. So they should be concerned about the uh, NIST, the National um, Institute for Standards and Technology. So NIST publishes a ton of great information uh, on things that, that the business owner should be doing inside the business. And a CEO hopefully has a CIO and a right. CISO and some people right. giving him this guidance so he can ask the board for more money and right. you know all those right. sorts of things. So, uh, but there's uh, you know Brian's Brian Krebs is a great start. Um, uh, Cisco, the Talos Group, uh, publishes. Um, threat briefs and uh, weekly updates on uh, kind of the stuff that's happening out there in the world that they see. Um, Cisco obviously sees traffic from on a global scale, so they see all the threats and threat actors and they know where malicious things are, are emanating from, right? So they, they report on all that kind of activity on a, on a, on a weekly basis. Talos, T-A-L-O-S, the Talos group's really good. Okay, well, um we, we uh, sort of moved around a, a bit, bit, but uh, but we're still uh, back at the um, at the uh, utility grid, which is uh, is going to continue to be a challenge, I think, for the utility and sure. also the ratepayers in in many different ways. Um, but uh, you know, one of the things that we haven't talked about was sort of what kind of damage you could do by penetrating um, by finding out people's passwords and by getting tricking people to click on to a site that um, that uh, takes the intruder right into their computer mm -hmm. uh, do you have any thoughts about that that um, that you might uh, give to our audience that yeah that so it's it's the number one tool of hackers so everyone really thinks it's all these technical controls right but the technical controls are things we can actually fix so like we talked about firewalling and monitoring. So we can really, and all those ports, you know, that are open, we can actually technically lock that stuff down. 
But what I can't lock down is the guy who calls you up and says, man, I gotta, you got to go look at this right away. This is your, you sent something, I'm your IT guy, and you need to go check on this link I just sent you. And then you click it. Boom. Now, if you just go to a, an email, mm -hmm. is, is there any way that they, they, that they can, just by not, not clicking on anything in the email, but just clicking the email to look at it, is, is there something that they could do to actually get you um, going down the road, so to speak? So you, you, giving you up your definitely own. want your email run through um, some services that, that look at that. Like, so Cisco has Umbrella. There's, there's, there's a lot of tools that are in place today. And a lot of Google, you know, Office, you know, Microsoft, a lot of them are running a lot of these filters against mm -hmm. that stuff. So you're not even seeing it. It's getting skimmed off before it gets to you. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are, so if you have like auto preview turned on, for example, right, and you've got, you get an image. Today you can embed code into a picture or a movie. So if you look, if you have auto preview running and that image is displayed, then yeah, they could run code. So you got to be careful. Um, you're, you, if you're running some decent antivirus, you know, software there, you should, you should be okay. okay. I'm a fan of the machine learning stuff that's out there today. Most of uh, Semantics now added some machine learning. You know, it was all signature based previously. So, you know, they had to know about the exploit to look for right, it. Right, right. So but zero, they look for these, telltale signs. Now. Right. So these zero day things weren't getting caught. But today with the machine learning that's been added uh, to, to a lot of the tools, um, we can look at we can look deeper at those things that are just rebundled and rebundled. Um, you know, you can look eight, eight or ten iterations deep to see if something is tr is truly a malicious or not okay. in an email. Well, you know, we're we're coming back uh, to the end of happens quick, time. doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I really want to uh, thank you for uh, being with us today, uh, Andrew Lanning, co-founder of Integrated Security Technologies. Um, that is all the time we have today, and uh, thanks to all of you for joining us today. Uh, please come back and see us. We're on Wednesday afternoons at uh, 4 o'clock, so uh, come see us then, and uh, we'll see you next Wednesday. Next time.